Good evening. <laughs> Good evening and um, welcome to the third in this uh, second series of uh, French Passions. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Simon McBurney, who is going to talk to us about uh, Rabelais. Uh, I'm Boyd Tonkin, I'm the literary editor of The Independent, uh, and I'm very pleased to be invited back uh, for uh, another event in this uh, extraordinary and incredibly enjoyable series. Um, just a, a couple of small uh, notes uh, at the outset. Um, Simon has kindly agreed to sign books afterwards uh, in the hall outside. Uh, and uh, I also wanted to remind you that the next event in the series is uh, with Michael Morpurgo, and that is happening on the 10th of November. Yeah, good to see that. That's, <laughs> that's okay. Well, um, we're very, very fortunate to, to have uh, for this evening's uh, event uh, one of the most extraordinary directors actors uh, om de théâtre, really, uh, of uh, our generation. Uh, someone who, uh, as I was telling him, has given me uh, many of my best nights in the theatre over the past uh, 20 years. Uh, Simon uh, started in the early 1980s in uh, Cambridge. The, the, like many people, he was a member of Footlights. Uh, he was involved in the fledgling uh, comedy scene then, uh, but then his uh, many years ago. <laughs> but then, uh, this is the interesting part. His career took a very different direction. Um, he went to, to Paris. He studied with um, uh, the great uh, guru uh, Jacques Lecoq. Um, he met uh, uh, Annabel Arden and the other co-founders of uh, Théâtre de Complicité, and. With them, he forged a style of theatre that has uh, been both entirely distinctive, but also has never rested on its laurels, has al always reinvented itself. So that uh, uh, it's uh, perhaps too easy to say that there's a complicité trademark, but, but the tr trademark, if it exists, is one of constant questioning and the development of a style of theatre which um, I refuse to call visual theatre because that, that's a slightly reductive shorthand. It's more a, a total theatre in which all the arts of the stage are um, intertwined and, and combined to produce something very, very new and very stimulating. I remember the great breakthrough production of uh, Duran Matt's The Visit, um, uh, later landmarks such as uh, Street of Crocodiles, based on the work of Bruno Schultz, the Three Lives of Lucy Cabral from John Berger, To the Wedding, also from Berger, a wonderful measure for measure, um, and more recently, The Elephant Vanishes, based on the stories of Haruki Murakami, uh, and uh, The Extraordinary, uh, A Disappearing Number, uh, where rather than there being a literary text as the origin of the work, um, uh, it was the mathematical relationship uh, both between the uh, Indian uh, genius mathematician Ramanujan and uh, his Cambridge mentor G. H. Hardy and also uh, the relationship between the numbers and the patterns themselves and I can't really think of a more demanding ask for a night in the theatre but uh, it was an extraordinary success. Uh, more recently, we have seen uh, Shunkin, based on a novel by uh, the Japanese classic uh, Tanizaki, uh, and uh, Bulkarkov's A Dog's Heart uh, at uh, the ENO. Now, as if that wasn't enough, uh, Simon is also a, an utterly memorable character actor. Uh, very recently, in the film of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, in the new versions of the Borgias, and a particular favorite of mine, the, the Archdeacon in Rev, 
um, the which is uh, for those of you who don't know it. Uh, Got to pay the rent. <laughs> a fantastically um, sharp uh, sitcom about, of all things, ecclesiastical life in East London, and. Um, I mention Ref because it, it, it allows me a rather cheesy link to someone who had e ecclesiastical connections himself, uh, François Rabelais, um, monk, uh, doctor, um, literary genius, all-round uh, provocateur, the person who um, produced a particular strain of French literature which is far from being uh, exhausted. Um, and someone who I think it's fair to say is less known, less honoured, less celebrated in Britain uh, than he ought to be, uh, even now um, more than, what is it, about uh, um, 450 years uh, after his death. So I wanted to start by asking Simon the obvious question, why Rabelais? Why did this extraordinary figure first make an impact on you? Because he's necessary. I mean, why for me, why I need him, you know? I need Rabelais. There are uh, people that you need in your life, certain artists that you need, and I need a, a, a Rabelais. If I feel trapped or if I'm in despair, <coughs> I know that I can open... Uh, this book and uh, look at a chapter and immediately I will feel uh, relieved and released, relieved perhaps with laughter, released into a sense of freedom. I mean, it's really, you know, you, I need him like I, I need to shit, you know, this is the key thing. When you, if you can't have a shit, it's very uncomfortable. And when you do, you are relieved and you are released. You feel a great deal lighter. You, oof, you know, everything feels better. You go out, you know, you go in and there's a kind of, you know, you're laden down with an effort and you come out and everything is possible again, you know? Uh, this is, um, shit is a good word, you know? I mean, in origin, I mean, I know it was supposed to be talking about French, but the word shit originally means to separate, you know? So you're separated from your burden, you know, although some people want to hold on to their shit, so, you know, they're rather emotional about it. Goodbye, there you go, what a regret, you know? It's, uh, uh, it comes from shite in the Old English, which means to separate, and we get the same word in schism and schizophrenia, although perhaps that's more terrible because you can never separate. At least with shitting, you can separate every single day, you know. Oof, that bit of my body is gone. <coughs> I can go on to the next, oh, I can begin to eat again, you know. Put some more in my body, you know. Uh, uh, it's not a, a turd, it's kind of a less, um, as a word, it's less, uh, uh, it's more, more difficult because in the Old English it means to sort of flay or to scratch, you know. Um, so to, you know, to pass a turd always, I think, you know, maybe that's worse to have a shit is, you know, that's a, sort of, that feels like the right area, you know. Um, uh, I mean, you know, fart is a good word too, I think. They're all old English words, short, fart, shit, fuck. They're all sort of straight, ooh, ooh. They're Saxon words, ooh, ah, uh, you know, they engage the body. I mean, fart, of course, comes from paired, paired, which is an onomatic peic word, you know, in French, pi, 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 it's essentially the that that is that is the word you know um you know one of the one of in the 70s of course we were in the words of the great george carlin you know the seven words in the 70s that you can't say on television shit piss fuck cunt motherfucker cocksucker and tits those are the words you can't say on television and that was a fantastic routine he used to do because he was exposing all of these things and you know uh, I, I, I mean i won't go into the whole routine now don't worry um but i remember a bit of it you know he goes yeah, yeah shit piss fuck cunt motherfucker cocksucker and tits it's gonna bend your moral soul if you say them Cocksucker, cocksucker, we've, 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 we've misunderstood these words. Cocksucker, it's changed its meaning. 
It means a bad man. Cocksucker means a bad man. It used to mean a good woman. Um, so, I mean, for me, Chable is, you know, is about, uh, uh, is about uh, release, you know, I mean, he begins, you know, the, in Gargantua, of course, Gargantua is born, Gargantua meaning que grand tu as, uh, how big you are, how great you are, the giant Gargantua born to his mother Gargamel, his, his father Grand Goussier. Uh, and of course the great thing about that is that they're, they're eating tripe for days and she gets constipated, you know, that's the whole thing. And the whole thing starts with the constipation of, uh, of Gargamel because she's eating so much tripe. Uh, and really, you know, I think the best thing is to, let me just read that section because then we can really get down to it. Um, I hope you've all had dinner. Here we go. So uh, let me read a little bit about this because this is it's much better than talking about Rabelais. Uh, uh, Grand Goussier was a good fellow in his time and a notable jester. He loved to drink neat as much as any man that was in the world and would willingly eat salt meat. To this extent, he was ordinarily well furnished with gammons of bacon and so on. In the vigor of his age, he married Gargamel, daughter to the king of the Parpaillon, a jolly pug and a well-mouthed wench. These two did oftentimes do the two-backed beast together, joyfully rubbing and frotting their bacon against one another. In so far that at last she became great with child of a fair son and went with him into the eleventh month for so long, yea, longer may a woman carry her great belly, especially when it is some masterpiece of nature and a person predestinated to the performance in his due time of great exploits. And then she gives birth to him. I'm just going to try and find this in another version here. Um, here we go. It's, yes, yes. It's because uh, when and how Gargamel was delivered as follows, and if you do not believe it, may your fundament run loose. That's your shit for anyone who doesn't know. Hers did one afternoon, the third day of February, as a result of eating too many gardebillots. Gardebillots are greasy tripe derived from the quarrel. There was a profusion of tripe, as you realize, tripe so appetizing that everyone was licking his fingers over it. But the four devil mystery play of it all was that tripe cannot be kept for long, for it will go putrid. And that seemed a shame. So they decided to gobble it all up and waste none of it. To do that, they sent invitations to the citizens of the village of Ciné, Seuilly, La Roche Clermont, and Vaugaudry, not forgetting those of Caudray Montpensier and Guy de Vede, and others nearby, all good wine bibbers, good company, and fine skittlers with their balls. Anyway, what happens while they were exchanging tittle tattle, and suddenly, she started to uh, feel pains in her belly. And she said to her husband, Grand Goussi, I will prove it to you. He said, uh, 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 ah, he says, she, she said, a woman when she is in travail hath sorrow, but as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish. A little bit like us with our shits. Ah, she said, you have spoken well, and I would far rather hear such words from the gospel, and I feel much better for it, than to hear the life of St. Margaret or some other black beetlebury. But I wish to God, she said, you'd cut it off. Cut what off? asked Grand Goussier. Ah, she said, there's a man for you, you know what I mean, all right. Ah, what, my member, he said. By goat's blood, if that's what you mean, bring me a knife, somebody. Ha! Ah, God forbid! God forgive me, she said. I never meant it seriously. Don't do anything whatsoever because of what I said. But unless God helps me, I shall have a rough day today on all account of your member to make you feel nice. 
take heart, he said, take heart, worry no more. The four oxen in front can manage the wagon. I shall be off for another quick swig. Shortly afterwards, she started to groan and cry out. At once from all directions, there came piles of midwives who, groping about her bottom, came across some bits of membrane in rather bad taste and thought that it was the baby, but in fact it was her fundament which had loosened because of the mollification of the rectum into his destinum, which you call the arse gut, resulting from her eating the excess of tripe, which we spoke about earlier. Whereupon a dirty old crone in the throng, who, with a reputation as a leech, has settled there some 60 years ago, concocted a constrictive for her, so horrific that all her sphincters were obstructed and contracted, to such an extent that you could only, with great effort, have forced them apart with your teeth. That's a horrible thought. As a result of that mishap, the cotton and adory veins of her womb were released from above and the child sprang through them, entered through the vena cava, and clambering through the midriff, which is situated above the shoulders, where the aforesaid vena divides into two, took the left path and emerged through her left ear. The moment he was born, he did not whimper, meh, 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 as other babies do. He yelled at the top of his voice, come and drink, 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 inviting one and all, it would seem, to have a drink. So well that he was heard all through the lands of Bus and Biberet. I doubt whether you assuredly believe this strange nativity. If you do not believe it, I don't really care. But a proper man, a good man of sense, always believes what he's told and what he finds written down. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I want to go back. When you were reading Where? this, how, how, old, we how old were you? Where were you? What language were you reading it in? And what um, effect did it have? Sitting on my mother's knee, yes, yes. reading about fundament. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, I heard about Rabelais. My father, who was a French speaker, used to talk about Rabelais. And then I didn't really know very much, but he used to give a sort of little slightly coy smile. Um, so I knew that there must be something interesting in it, something dirty somewhere. Um, but I read him, I guess, when I was doing English literature and I had to do French and I didn't understand the French at all. Of course, it's, 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 it's not a, it's a, 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 a Renaissance French. So like Shakespeare for uh, non-English speakers, Rabelais for non-French speakers, as I, 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 I was at the time, is, 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 is more difficult. Um, I'm not sure if I'll be able to attempt to read uh, um, some in the original uh, uh, French, but it's very, very beautiful. But I didn't really understand it, and I put it aside. It wasn't really until I went to France and I studied with Lecoq, who was really Rabelaisian in all his senses, that um, uh, I started to get excited by it. And then just the fact that you can take this book and you can read two pages and it's marvellous. But I mean, it's very difficult. I find it very difficult to, to talk about, really. Um, you know, with this extraordinary image of the fact that the baby comes up through her, I, I, you know, she's, she, she's got a constricted arse because she's constipated and it can't come out that way. So then it takes a different route and goes up her vein where it splits and then out of her ear. Uh, and it's a giant, of course, uh, a huge giant. So, I mean, what's going on there? Well, I mean, there's two images, really. It's the idea of constriction and then this extraordinary that this baby will come out at all costs and will come out saying, come on, let's drink, <laughs> let's drink. So it's like one part of human nature. It's, if you like, it's the irrepressible part of human nature which will never take the course it's told to take. So immediately there is a kind of a spirit of, Anarchy. So, so did you identify with the spirit of anarchy? Was it? Uh, did you feel that you were going down that route anyway, and Rabelais was showing you the the, the right direction? Oh, uh, um, I don't know. I mean, I think you know. I think the the fact is that it's um, it's funny. You know, I mean, he, uh, Rabelais is about the body, and the body is uh, uh, by definition funny, and so. Uh, I mean, there's always a, but there's always a, uh, a, a question of 
or a, a, an assumption about comedy or the comedic or what is funny, very often the comedic is held up to be, if you like, laugh, light, artificial, an escapist, or uh, even vulgar. Uh, it seems to me, and somehow tragedy is more sort of sophisticated, it's sort of tender to our dignity and our self-importance as human beings. And it seems to me that actually the opposite is true, that comedy reveals the absurd truth, which is why we hate being laughed at in real life. I'm in rehearsals uh, uh, at the moment, and somebody farted in rehearsals. Of course, it was their body expressing themselves. Uh, it's very, very funny for everybody else, but they feel, of course, rather embarrassed at that particular moment. Um, but it's, uh, uh, I I I comedy exposes the truth. Uh, and this is what Rable does. He takes his surgeon's knife, he was a doctor. And if you like, the one of the beautiful things about that description of the birth is that it's actually completely accurate in terms of the medical world, the medical knowledge at the time. So uh, it's everything that he knew. And even there's another bit here, let me, uh, which is not about birth, but it's about killing and death, about the monk in book four, which also shows his medical knowledge, which is extraordinary. This is, this is, this is a joke for doctors in the audience. The monk, this is where Pantagruel, who is in fact Gargantua's son, is later on one of his voyages and he's being attacked. And amongst his retinue is the monk. The monk, seeing them make off in disorder, these are other soldiers, conjectured that they were on their way to attack Gargantua and his men. And it made him wondrously depressed that he could not help them. Immediately afterwards, he drew forth that sword and struck the archer who was holding him on his right, entirely severing the sweated arteries in his neck, his jugular veins, together with the uvula, right down to the two thyroid glands, then withdrawing his sword, prized open the spinal marrow, half open between the second and the third vertebra, at which the archer dropped down dead. At which the second monk, seeing himself in such danger, said, Ah, my lord prior, I give in, my lord prior, my dear friend, my lord prior. And the monk similarly bawled, My lord posterior, my friend, my lord posterior, you shall get it on your posterior. Whereupon he sliced through his head at one blow, cutting his cranium just above the petrous bone, removing both the bones of the cynicabut as well as the sagittal suture, together with a greater part of the coronal bone. By so doing, he sliced through both meninges and opened up that deeply the two posterior ventricle cavities of the brain, and so his cranium remained hanging down over his shoulders at the back from the membranes of the pemicranium in the form of a kind of doctoral bonnet, black above, red within. And thus did the second monk fall down to the ground quite dead. So, uh, you know, you can see there somebody who knew all his bones. I mean, it, you know, it turns into absolutely, you know, a brilliant piece of farce. But uh, um, it struck uh, me as you were reading that, that the, the, uh, the, the great genius or, or the, the, the music of Rabelais, it, it's, it's not simply this incredible physicality, the, the urges and appetites of the body. It's this combined w w with a, 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 a quite profound intellectualism with the, the rhetoric of the Renaissance, the language of medicine, uh, of, of, of philosophy, of um, theology. So it, it's, the, it's, the, it's the mind and the flesh being brought together. Uh, and uh, is that part of the appeal? Yeah, that's, well? I mean, that's absolutely key because there is no, um, there is no separation. He is pre-Cartesian. There's no separation between mind and body. And in my opinion, he's absolutely right. Um, for Rabelais, the body is good. Nothing bad comes from the body. 
the body in all its forms, its anguish, its sorrow, its happiness, its shitting, its loving, its fucking, its farting, its pleasure, its higher pleasures, its interest in other things, its, but it's also its interest in food. There isn't any separation between one thing and another thing. If you like, our mystical experience begins in our bellies for Rabelais. Anything which goes with, is up at the top is connected all the way down to what is right down at the bottom. There isn't any gap. There is no uh, Cartesian split between mind and body. And anybody who is, if you like, a student of the science of consciousness would also fundamentally agree or what the what the mind is you can't talk about the mind uh, as being separate from uh, 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 who we are um, uh, who we are is just uh, this and what this is is in a sense inseparable from the world and what I think is so I mean uh, there's a classic uh, let me uh, 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 I think it's best, really, to let Rabelais speak rather than my trying to speak about Rabelais. T to give you an idea of how he goes from the right from the bottom, if you like, to, uh, forgive the expression, the bottom, to uh, the top. Grand Goussier, who's Gargantua's father, was on his way back from defeating the Canarians. And he was thrilled to see that his son, who was just growing up, and I have to say that I uh, really identify with this right now because I have two small children. And yesterday, at four o'clock in the morning, yesterday, a very great friend of mine died, and I was very sad. She died at four o'clock in the morning, and I only learned of it much later. And my wife said to my daughter, Noma, um, you know, Dada's, Dada, uh, Daddy's, Daddy's, Daddy's sad because his friend has died. And she came and hugged me, and she was very tender. And then she turned to her little brother, and she pulled up his nightdress, and she said, look, tit is bottom. <laughs> and the conjunction of the two things was, for me, pure Rabelais, that the two things exist, that, 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 that humor and death and birth, all of these things exist at the same time. And anyway, I like this passage because Gargantua has just learned how to wipe his bottom. Uh, so, uh, Grand Goussier says, uh, uh, how did you manage to learn that, said Grand Goussier? After long and careful experimentation, said the young Gargantua, I've invented a way of wiping my bum, which is the most royal and most lordly and the most excellent one ever seen. Which way was that, said Grand Goussier? I shall tell you now, said Gargantua. Once I wiped my bum on a velvet muffler belonging to one of your young ladies. That I found good, for the softness of the silk gave great pleasure to my fundament. It was the same another time when I used a lady's lace bonnet. Yet another time I used a neckerchief, another some crimson satin earmuffs, but the gilt work on a pair of pile of shitty pearls stuck them into, m in, into my arse and skinned all my bum. May St. Anthony's fire scorched the arse gut of the jeweller which made them and of the young lady who wore them. The pain went away and then I wiped my bottom on a page's bonnet full of sweetser-style plumes. And then while I was pooing behind a bush, I came across a march cat and I wiped my bum on that, but its claws ulcerated my perineum. The following morning, I made it all better by wiping myself on mummy's gloves, all redolent of her bad crack. Then I wiped my bum on sage, fennel, dill, marjoram, and rose petals, on the leaves of vegetable marrow, on cabbages, the vine, mallows, long wort, which gives you a raw bottom, I can tell you, daddy, lettuces, spinach, which all did me a pile of good. Uh, and then I wiped myself on linen sheets, on a blanket, the curtains, a cushion, a carpet, a base, tablecloth, a table napkin, a headscarf, a handkerchief, a shoulder cloth. I even found more pleasure in all of them than the mangy folk do when you scratch them. Yes, I'm sure, said Congressier. Which arse wiper did you find best? Well, I was just about to come to that, said Gargantua. You'll soon know it. You'll soon know it. I wiped my bottom on hay, straw, oakum, flock, wool, and paper, but... Use paper on your dirty bum, on your bollocks, splatter some. 
Well, I never did, said Gongusier. Have you caught at the rim, seeing you've begun to rhyme? Oh, yes, Daddy. Yes, I have. Yes, indeed, king of mine, I can rhyme all the time, e'en when snotty in frost or rhyme. And look, I've got a list here uh, uh, about uh, all who poo. Squit a shitter, fart a thundering, drop a dunger, larder scumbering, squirting, turding, fouling. May Eripsilus bite you, sir. If failing, your ring cleaning, you wipe it not without demur. Shall I go on? Yes, please, said Gongusier. Well then, said Gargantua, whilst truly dropping yesterday the tribute owing by my bum, an unexpected smell did come. An evil pong about me lay, if only someone brought my way, that girling whom I longed to come while pooing, I would my tool to her display and get it then i would by gum and into that pee hole neath her tum whilst her fair fingers cleaned away my pooing can we get back to the subject said grand goussier what which pooing said gargantua no said grand goussier the wiping of bottom but said gargantua are you prepared to pay me a vat of breton wine if i render you speechless yes certainly said grand goussier well, to conclude, I affirm and maintain there is no bottom wiper like a downy young goose, provided that you hold its head between your legs. Believe me on my honour, for you can feel it in your bum hole, a miracle voluptuousness, as much from the softness of its down as from the temperate heat of the young goose, which is readily communicated to the arse gut and the rest of the intestines until it reaches the region of the heart and the brain. And do not believe that the blessedness of the heroes and demigods in the Elysian fields lies in their nectar, asphodel, or ambrosia, as these old women would maintain. No, such beautiful feelings, in my opinion, consist in the fact that they wipe their bums on a young goose. <laughs> and I, I, I mean... This, for me, is what is beautiful, is, is the arse wiping then becomes a mystical experience, you know, and, and it goes all, it goes this extraordinary, and, and it, the other thing is, uh, I think, which is b beautiful about it is, uh, uh, you know, because it's rooted in the body, it's all about this present moment. So, in this extraordinary work of literature, of course, why it's thrilling for somebody who works in the theatre, is that above everything else, Rabli is about now. It's about the present moment. And that's a very difficult thing for a writer to achieve because generally when you write, everyone, particularly a narrative or a story, it's always leading on to the next thing. It's about what's going to happen next when the ending will come. And on the contrary, in Rabelais, what happens is he takes you right into this moment now, whether it's just by making you laugh or by the sheer virtuosity of the sort of um, uh, uh, craziness of the word illusions he has or the ideas which are fantastical. Uh, and you follow him like in some sort of extraordinary uh, uh, dream where you never really know what is going to come next, but you are eternally in the now. And when you were building your own career in the theatre with um, complicity, where this physicality combines well, with with, with, um, <laughs> with um, uh, I, I was taking it to a more fundamental level. I think yes. Um, uh, uh, so this physicality, but also the ability to. Uh, to present to stage quite complex ideas, uh, um, states of mind, uh, forms of thought. How much was Rabelais and his inspiration guiding you? Was he there as a sort of background uh, um, buzz? W was he directly influential at all? I mean, you know, it goes back to what I said at the beginning. Uh, uh, um, he. Uh, we, you know, I think for me, uh, politically, if you like, we need Rabelais. You can read Rabelais and you can say, I don't understand this bit because it is a very complex uh, piece of satire about the Roman Catholic Church. I'm not going to read you uh, uh, all sorts of passages there, but 
Of course, we don't live in Rabelais' time. But I think there is something absolutely fundamental that's happening in the Renaissance with the arrival of Rabelais, and of course, at the same time, you have Shakespeare, is that you have the invention of language or a new way of expression or perhaps an exploration of language, renaissance, a rebirth, uh, an opening out. And of course, it's no um, chance that the subject underlying all of this is a question of liberation, of freedom, of, you know, I've just happened to have read these particular passages, but I'll read some others later, um, which are not only about turds and farting, but the key thing is that in looking at uh, these parts of the body, what he is saying is, this is the world. The world is not averting your eyes to anything or listening to the sensations of the body and that they are part of a whole picture which is here now. We are here now. In a hundred years, all of us, everybody in this room is going to be a little pile of dust or not even that. We won't be here. We only have what is here now. Uh, it could be that many of us are already thinking about our dinners or what happened before or wishing that I <coughs> wouldn't read such scatological portions of Rabelais but would get on to some perhaps more intellectually uh, challenging moments. But I would say this is intellectually challenging. I mean, it's also beautiful for another reason because of its extraordinary rhythmical capacity. But the reason, again, coming back, uh, why perhaps he stays with me or why... Uh, I consider him political, is again to do with this question of the present and of time. Because we live in a time where we are very rarely present, where we have very little attention to what is now. The fundamental aspect and why I find him urgent in this moment and helpful and a support is because the society that we live in, the global society that we live in, is one of mass consumer capitalism. A mass consumer capitalism, as it stands, without saying whether it's good or bad, but what it depends upon is not being present. Now, we have the illusion that were present, that were very sensual, were surrounded by images of sex, were surrounded by images of food, but they are sanitized images in which kind of very rarely do we see the animal being killed. When we go into the supermarket, we can't tell. The images of sex are super sanitized, you know. Rarely do you get, you know, I wish somebody would put a sort of a huge image of a great hairy cock one day to say, you know, buy this car. At least it would be more honest, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, that's, it's all implied. Yeah. It's super that's, clean, you know. Yeah. And by the way, I shave. You know, um, so there's a sort <laughs> yeah, of yeah. distance yeah. to yeah. the blood yeah. and sweat of it. But more that's importantly, to come back to the mass consumer culture, everything depends on not being present because, you know, here I am, part of it. I have this, but the key thing is that I want the 4GS, that's a 3GS, yeah, the 4GS, which is currently yeah. being advertised by Stephen Fry on the front of The Guardian. That's the one I want. Mm. It's in the future. I don't have it, but I must want it because otherwise the whole economic situation doesn't work. I must want it. As soon as I bought it, it's in the past. Now I must want that. The time of the present is only this moment of quick economic exchange. And if you like, this, is, uh, this begins as a result of the Industrial Revolution. It's foreseen by artists in the 1930s, whether it's someone like Ezra Pound, who says, you know, where he sees words themselves have been kind of just instruments of, of sort of economic exchange. Words, he said, have become coins 
in the hands of counter-word mongers. And here in Rabelais, what he does is he says, you only have the present. Look at this. You, you know, beyond this enormous expanse of present time. And of course, for, for somebody who works in the theatre, who works with the material of being present, because the theatre is the art of the present, and I don't just mean, well, you know, he's live, um, and uh, 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 and the cinema is not, you know, there. But I mean that it, the subject matter is the present. Every time I make a piece, when the piece is also referring to present time, it also has a kind of root for the audience, because in the end, theatre only exists in the minds of the audience. It doesn't exist anywhere else. So uh, we have these this, these two great parallel models of to be Kantian about it, imminence against transcendence, um, the uh, Rabelaisian text and the kind of theatre work that you do. Can they be brought together? Could you adapt Rabelais? Well, I, I'm, I'm of the belief that you can make theatre out of anything. I've never, curiously, I've never actually thought about making theatre out of Rabelais because when you read him, he's already theatre. And, you know, he doesn't really need me to put him on the stage. He's already on the stage. Um... Uh, uh, and, of course, many, many adaptations have been made of Gargantua Pantagruel. But he's of such a dimension that it is an extraordinarily daunting task. I mean, I haven't read this particularly well because I'm in the middle of uh, uh, rehearsals and so, you know, it requires a real engagement and um, you need to really learn it. But you can perhaps glimpse some of the sort of the, the, the connections, the lists that he makes, uh, which take us away from the idea of something going to happen next. Instead of something happening next, you want to know what word is going to come next, what image is going to come next. So, um, you know, uh, I know the answer is, having veered again off the subject, um, the answer is I haven't thought of putting him on the stage. Um, but uh, 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 if you did, um, you know, I, I, I mean, the way, the only way I could conceive of staging Rabelais would be in the dark. So that all people would do would be to listen and somehow be present that way because uh, everything that he does is I mean, the extraordinary thing about his language, and I wish I could read some in some of the original French, because it has the same quality as, um, uh, uh, as something like Chaucer, if you can read it, you know. Uh, you know and then he let flay a fert as loud it were a thunderclout. You know, there's a whole kind of, and then he let fly a fart as loud it were a thunderclap. That's what it means, but that's a, it, again, it has this sort of physical quality to the language. Um, and that's why I quoted George Carlin at the beginning, because perhaps those are the kinds of people who can, I mean, it's almost like uh, stand-up comedy, but then it has this absolutely, <laughs> you see, at the same time, it has this extraordinary poetic side to it as well, I think. Um, and by poetic, I mean not narrative. The difference between poetry and narrative is, you know, trying to quote, if I can quote by heart somehow, uh, John Berger when he says, you know, all narrative is about battles of one sort or another, another which move towards the end outcome where there will be victory or defeat. It's everything moves towards the end where the outcome will be known. And poetry, he says, crosses the battlefields, listening to the wild cries of the victorious or the wounded. 
and it brings a kind of peace. Uh, not by easy reassurance or anesthesia, says Berger, but by the idea that what has happened cannot uh, be taken away as if it had never been. So in other words, to try and embody something in words, so the words themselves sort of have a physical quality. Um, what's the time? How long have we been talking I think, for? Um, uh, I, I wanted to leave a few minutes for people to ask questions, but I wondered whether there's any other short piece um, uh, that uh, you might want to share with us since uh, it's uh, such an extraordinary pleasure to hear you read it. Um, I would love to, yeah, and I think it's really this is... This is a piece um, 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 let me just try and find this. And this I will try and read in uh, a 17th century, 18th century translation by a man called Thomas Urquhart, who's a wonderful translator of um, Rabelais. Uh, uh, has a very different to the sort of the quality of the other piece which comes from the penguin that I was reading before. And in this, if you can imagine, you have Gargantua, then his son Pantagruel, uh, who, when he was born, you know, 4,000 oxen drawing carts came out of his mother's vagina before he did. Um, what was extraordinary about that image is the fact that it really gives a sense of birth. It's not the literal image, but the enormity of the act of birth. Anyway, Pantagruel then grows up, and he becomes almost like a Socratic figure. He goes on this enormous long voyage in which he learns things, and he's in on a boat with this sort of rather dirty companion called Panurge, who is a sort of grotesque figure, like a sort of uh, a, a sort of Lear's fool, but Pantagruel himself, this enormous giant, who constantly changes size, by the way. Um, 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 they're on a boat, and they're in the middle of the sea, and it's frozen, and they start to hear something in the distance, and it's words, and the pilot uh, of the boat, the skipper, they were frightened, and the skipper made answer, Be not afraid, my lord, we are on the confines of the frozen sea on which, about the beginning of last winter, happened a great and bloody fight between the Arimaspians and the Nephilabites. Then the words and cries of men and women, the hacking, slashing, hewing of battle axes, the shocking, knocking, and jolting of armors and harnesses, the neighing of horses, and all other martial din and noise froze in the air, and now, the rigor of winter being over by the succeeding serenity and warmth of the weather, these words melt and are heard. By jingo, quoth Panurge, the man talks somewhat like. I believe him, but couldn't we see some of them? I think I've read that on the edge of the mountain on which Moses received the Judaic law, the people saw the voices sensibly. Hear, hear, said Pantagruel. Here are some that are not yet thawed. And then he threw us on the deck whole handfuls of frozen words, which seem to us like your rough sugar plums of many colours, like those used in heraldry some vert, some azure, some black. And when we had somewhat warmed them between our hands, they melted like snow, and we really heard them, but could not understand them, for it was a barbarous gibberish. One of them only, that was pretty big, having been warmed between Friar John's hands, gave out a sound much like that of chestnuts when they are thrown into the fire, without being first cut, which made us all start. This was the report of a field piece in its time, cried Friar John. Panurge prayed Pantagruel to give him some more, but Pantagruel told him that to give words, to give words, was the part of a lover. Sell me some then, I pray you, cried Panurge. That's the part of a lawyer, returned Pantagruel. I would sooner sell you silence, though at a dearer rate. However, he threw three or four handfuls of words on the deck, among which I perceived some very sharp words, some bloody words, which the pilot said used sometimes to go back and recoil to the place whence they came. But it was with a slit weasened, 
We also saw some terrible words and some others not very pleasant to the eye. When they had all melted together, we heard a strange noise. And I do not know what other barbarous words which the pilot said were the noise made by charging squadrons the shock and neighing of horses. Then we heard some large ones go off like drums and fife. Believe me, we had very good sport with them. I would fain, I would fain have saved some merry odd words and preserved them in oil as ice and snow are kept and between clean straw. But Pantagruel would not let me, saying that tis a folly to hoard up what we are never like to want and have always at hand. Odd, quaint, merry and fat words never being scarce among all good and jovial pantagruelists. <laughs> Well, um, it's it, it's absolutely wonderful, uh, and it, it it has that lyricism um, and the image yes, of a yes, frozen word. You know, it's yeah. so it's such an extraordinarily graphic yes. picture, yes. Yes. And, yes. you know, and such a wonderful sort of leap of the imagination. Yes. You know, yes. it's as as wonderful as anything that Kafka uh, has come up with. You know, or or, or, or or you know Lewis Carroll. It's a great sort of you feel so liberated, not only in the body by Chablé, but also in the mind. Maybe we could have a, a couple of questions, if we can just have um, the lights up. That's no, we can't no, have we the can't. lights up. No, no. Yes. Yes, yes let's yes, have a yes, question. Yes, yeah. yes. When the work was, was published, was it considered blasphemous, Robin? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a very interesting point. You have to remember that the first book, uh, which was Gargantua, was published under a pseudonym, Africa Bias Nazier, I think it is, which is basically Rabelais' name in an anagram. Hugely popular. Um, and he had to live carefully under the protection of certain influential, politically influential people. And when they died, it was a huge problem to him. Uh, also, there's an entire section in which he wanted to use the words Jesus Christ and was unable to. And so there are terms which uh, are synonyms or, you know, th their s even symbols and ideas which people would have known about at the time which stand in for things like Jesus Christ because to have um, put that in his, uh, in his books would have been dangerous. But his books were dangerous. There's no question that they were dangerous. They've been banned at various points. Um, people didn't want to read them. But the... Uh, um, so that is a beautiful thought, which is that he resisted, if you like, he cut through the codes, cut through the doctrine, the, 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 the idea of the reality of the church, the reality of the state, the reality of education at that time, or the reality of the Sorbonne, what was considered uh, a proper, what was considered polite, what was considered uh, all the different versions of the world. There was no, you know, the world was not at a distance like it is for us now. Rabelais cut through all fictions, if you like, or he did through his art, as all art in some sense should do, and put a very wicked slice 
through the curtain with which most people had to view the world and said, actually, look, it's here and it's like this. And yes, because of your question, it's true. It was also an act of considerable political courage. Thanks. Is there another question? Yes. Right there. Well, surely it really hasn't changed from t today's world as the world as it was before. I mean, do you think an audience today would be ready and prepared and want to watch and face the truth that Rabelais is actually saying through his text? I have no idea. No, no. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I mean, it's it's true. You know, I mean, the, you know, a Rabelaisian thing would be to. What I was trying to say is, you know, you you. Rabelais would put a cock on that, you know, if, 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 if you're trying to sell a car by basically talking about men's cocks, you know, he said, well, you know, don't bother with the car, car let's just put the cock up there, that's better. Sure. You know, uh, let's go right to the point of it. Um, so, of course, you know, uh, I, I mean, I have been in tour, on tour in places, in many different places in the world, but I mean, to give you an example of how far we are separated from reality, I remember going to Japan once and in the ladies' uh, toilets, uh, there's a special button that you can press in which the sound, there's quite a loud sound of tinkling water so that nobody outside the toilet will actually hear the sound of you urinating. So, you know, that's how far <laughs> we are separated from our bodies. Thanks. Is there another question? Yes. Towards Is there a satirical interpretation of the text, I mean, like, like Jonathan Swift, for example, or is it just jolly good fun? <laughs> well, um, yes, of course, there's a satirical interpretation of the text. Um, I mean, there wasn't really time to read some other bits. There's a marvellous um, uh, piece that I was going to read, which is about... Um, a student who pretends to have Latin, but then you know th that's just a, to one section in which the pretentiousness of the idea of Latin learning is kind of ripped open, uh, so that it's the equivalent of taking somebody on stage and um, you know using pure advertising speak and then ripping them open at the same time. So there is that, but then is there is also a very clear dissection of Roman Catholic law and why it's just a pile of shit, basically, uh, all the way through. And also, uh, um, but sh it's shot through with this extraordinary humanity in the sense that it's not delivered with a kind of bitterness. Uh, Swift rightly felt bitter about the treatment of the Irish, and so in a modest proposal when he suggested that everyone, that Irish babies were extremely succulent and tender, and they really would make a very fine dish on London tables, you know, particularly good roasted with little honey on the outside of their skin. Um, it was, it, there is a fantastic aggression coming through, and what is strange in Rabelais is that there's a sort of curious humanity, so that you have this grotesque, huge, giant Pantagruel who's doing all of these extraordinary sort of things associated with the body. Um, and yet, at the same time, um, uh, 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 he, there is this extraordinary humanity. So there's never, Pantagruel is constantly ticking off Panurge for crowing over defeating their enemies. And Pantagruel picks up the wounded and says, you know, this was our enemy, but he's now wounded and he should be allowed to live. Why should we discriminate against these people? They come across a strange island of different people. And he says, no, but these people have as much right as we do. So it's a very fascinating, uh, uh, um, this, is, this is why he's so entrancing, I think because his knife is as sharp as Swift's, but his warmth is as human as Shakespeare's. And that's an, a, an amazing breadth. Uh, and he's a man who sort of lived outside the norms. Uh, himself, he was not only a doctor of medicine, but he was also a lawyer. So his intellectual learning was astonishing. And of course, Greek, as we know at the time, was thought to be very louche. 
to learn Greek. Oh, dear me. Everyone learned Latin. Latin was the, was, the, was the language of the church. Greek, you know, introduces some very dangerous Greek ideas, you know, Dionysiac ideas. And, uh, of course, Greek was very important to Rabelais because it was through Greek teachings that he came across his understanding of medicine. Um, thank you. Well, it would be lovely to be able to continue, but um, I think we should uh, wrap up there. It's been a, a really amazing privilege to not only to, 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 to hear Simon talk about Rabelais, but to, to be Rabelais. Well, there's um, one that's more thing, Boyd, I wanted to say, is that he's, because it's so, th this question of, of dances and dancing, uh, of the body. I mean, one tiny, this is really small that I wanted. The point is, is that, uh, uh, I mean, at the end, you know, uh, 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 of the fifth book, he writes down all these dances. It suddenly turns very beautiful, a dance called Cabbages. I mean, the lists of things that existed at the time, which is so fascinating. Uh, 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 and the musical quality. Uh, which sort of, uh, again, you know, with sort of some folk groups, you can, you, you, the thing about Rabelais is that you can hear something of the music of the time, which some folk groups uh, 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 still, you can just sort of hear the echoes of it. I think we've got a little piece of uh, 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 music from, which is from, in fact, from Naples. And this is the kind of thing that he would have heard, thinking about hearts, about dances, things like, uh, um, which he called things like a dance called My Pretty Heart, Fair Foot, Fair Eye, Ah, Shepherd Maiden, My Beloved, The Spinstresses, Pavan, Alas, You Are So Fair, The Daisy, How Good It Is, Time Past, The Pretty Wood, Comes Now The Hour, Most Dolorous He, My Cunt Is A Catchpole, whatever the, that dance was, Strike Now That Ancient Air, Little Perfection Here May Hide, Save laughter, little else you'll find. No other theme comes to my mind. Seeing such gloom, your joy doth ban. My pens to laughs, not tears assigned. Laughter's the property of man. Live joyfully.